Good morning. I'm so glad to see everyone today. Let's stand as we worship together this morning.
that you are all here with us today. Um, I'd love for you to join me in doing our centering prayer. Father, overwhelm us with your love so that we live from the beauty of being your children. Jesus, deepen our love for you and teach us to love each other and all people the same way you love us. Spirit, equip us and shape us as a sent people who partner with you. All right. Good morning, everybody. Glad that you're here. You can have a seat for a few minutes. Uh, my name is Michael. I'm one of the ministers here. Um, it's been a really good weekend here at the New Garden campus. Yesterday, we had a mobile food pantry right outside. We were able to serve 180 households, 800 people um, in total. It was a really good day. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Clap for that. Um, it was great to have folks from the Green Hill uh, ROTC group come and also from the Woodmont campus and just people in our community who just saw that something good was happening and wanted to be a part of it. Um, and that's something that we want to continue to encourage and grow. Um, so if you see anybody walking in here um, that you might not recognize in the next couple weeks, um, say hi, get to know them. They might be somebody who was here volunteering with us yesterday. Um, so that was a really cool thing that we got to experience uh, together yesterday. Today is a family Sunday. So if you are a kid, you're staying in here with us today, K through 5. We've got a Sprouts is still happening for our preschoolers out there in the normal Sprouts area. So if that's something that you want to be a part of with your preschooler, go ahead um, and, and take advantage of that. Um, but if you're staying in here and you're a child or you're a child at heart, we've got these awesome little notes situations with fill in the blanks. And there's actually a, a, a prize if you fill out the blanks. Even if you missed a couple, if you participated in the activity, you can find Madeline afterwards and get a prize for participation. So these are up here. Uh, and you probably want to come on down right now and get these if you want. If you want to get these, these are really good. Um, you know, some things that, that are going to be on the screen that you can remember, um, and maybe some things that I forgot to make slides for. Um, it's okay if you don't get those. You can guess at the blanks, and you'll still get candy, okay? So um, go ahead and enjoy doing that. Um, maybe you're an adult, and you think, you know what? I would like some, something to keep my attention span um, as we... As we go through this morning together. That's something that you could do. Um, today, uh, CARA from NICE, which stands for the Nashville International Re Re Center for Empowerment. I don't know why I thought there was an R in there all of a sudden. Like, NICE doesn't have an R in it. Um, Nashville International Center for Empowerment. Um, she's here with us this morning. Uh, they do a lot of great work with refugees. That's why I was thinking about R. Um, and uh, she's going to share about what their organization does uh, and how we might be able to get involved, you on an individual level or us as a group. And so I'm really excited about her being here with us this morning. Um, and uh, our, our friends at the Woodmont campus are already really involved and nice in a lot of different ways. 
And so without, you know, having to be involved in the same way that some of those people might be, there might be something that she says this morning that you might think, hey, I would love to be involved in that way um, with NICE, with people in my community, in our immediate community here in Hermitage. And so uh, I'm really excited about her uh, being here with us, sharing about that. You know, like one of God's commands to the Israelite people is treat the foreigner like one of your own. Love them. Make sure that they're taken care of. Um, And there's a lot of people right here in our immediate community uh, who are not from here, um, who don't, they were not raised here. They don't speak uh, the language the way that we do. Um, They might not even understand how to get to the post office or how the postal system works. And so there's a lot of things um, that we can do as ambassadors of God, people who are welcoming our neighbors into our community. Uh, And NICE does a lot of that work, and they want to equip others to do that with them. And so I'm excited that Kara is here with us this morning. She's going to share with us in a little bit. Um, Other things happening next Sunday, uh, Dr. Thomas Snow from the Tennessee Prison Outreach Ministries is going to be here with us, uh, sharing about what they do. Um, And then, you know, of course, school's coming up, a lot of different things. So thank you all for being with us here this morning at New Garden I'm glad to see you. Um, it's, a, it's a good just to be in the room together singing praises. Uh, like last week was um, family sun, or super duper family Sunday, so we're all out in the lobby doing stuff that we would normally do in kids' praise. Um, so that was really good. And I opened my Bible app up this morning, and the main verse is, where two or, two or more are gathered, the Lord is there with them. Um, and so that's what we do every week. And that's what we get to do um, when we're doing the mobile food pantries or we're gathering together in different ways in different places. Um, God is here with us, and we can celebrate that this morning. So I'm going to invite our worship team. Uh, Actually, I'm going to tell them to stay because we have a kid's song that we're going to do in here this morning. I don't know if you remember last week. um, There are some technical difficulties. It really was like we were in kids' praise last week. Um, There are some technical difficulties. Uh, So we're going to do uh, a kid's song uh, after the prayer here this morning. So if you're a kid and you know the kids' songs that we normally do in kids' praise, come on down here, show us what you do, and you always act so shy, like, oh, I don't want to do this. And then you totally come down and do a great job. So go ahead and go on, make, make your way down here. Um, and uh, we'll do that song together. And then our worship team will continue to lead us in worship. Um, let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this place, this group of people. Uh, Thank you for yesterday. Uh, Thank you for the many people that were able to come through and receive food. And thank you for all the volunteers that came and uh, just supported uh, something happening that was good in their community. Um, God, help us to love our neighbors. Uh, Help us to love you. And thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Come on. spoke one word and the dark became light I believe it I believe it yeah you spoke my name and my heart came to life I believe it I believe it yeah I want to sing about it I want to scream and shout it I'm gonna sing it right now
Sprouts can be dismissed to your worship time. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child. Amazing grace, 
God, thank you for this day. Thank you that we can gather here as your body. Lord, we pray that you open our hearts to hear what you need to tell us today, God. In your son's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Um, I want to say one thank you guys so much for having me, for reserving a little space um, in your service this morning for me. This feels very nostalgic because I grew up at a church where we met in a school for a long time. And so now I go to a really large church and this feels a little bit like, oh, this feels like home to me because I remember having to like, you know, bring in the sound equipment every week and pack up the sound equipment and we set up chairs every week. And I was like that feeling of, you know, just the closeness of a small community um, where you guys are all kind of working together to set up and tear down. Um, this feels a little nostalgic for me to be here. So I um, want to say thank you. Um, like Michael said, I am um, Kara Sievers. I'm the Community Engagement Manager at NICE. We are Nashville International Center for Empowerment. Um, Woodmont Hills Church has been a longtime partner for us and just honestly great friends to our organization um, for a lot of years. So I don't know how many of you all have had the chance to visit Woodmont's campus. I know you guys are connected, um, but Woodmont on their campus hosts our monthly team meetings. They um, have space for us for citizenship classes, for English classes, and so they've been a really great partner for us. Um, we recently actually have partnered with a um, community right here in Hermitage, like in your backyard, basically. So the Burning Tree Apartment Complex is now housing for um, a lot of families, newly arrived refugee families, um, which is very close to you guys. And so um, I actually was talking to some people at Woodmont and they shared about your congregation and you guys being so close. Um, I thought it would be a great opportunity um, if there's any ways that you were wanting to get connected um, that you can be a part of this. So I'm going to share a little bit about our organization and how I got involved. Um, I actually started as a volunteer with a resettlement agency um, in 2021 during the Afghan crisis. So when there's lots and lots of people from Afghanistan coming into the country, I got connected. Um, I was like, I don't really know a whole lot what I can do, but I have a little time in my weeks. And so got connected with a family um, as a mentor and got to be a part of kind of helping them navigate when they first moved here. And they're still actually great friends of mine. Um, we, we do lots of dinners together. I eat lots of great Afghan food with them. Um, and they're still a, a part of kind of my life and my community. So NICE is, um, for those of you who are unfamiliar, we are a um, refugee resettlement and social service agency. So we kind of, from the moment families who are refugees arrive into the country, um, we meet them at the airport and we help with housing, with employment, um, with getting signed up for benefits. Um, anything that it takes to kind of like find your way in a new place is what we're doing um, for the refugee community, um, trying to help them to get to a point of um, thriving in their new place. So um, a little bit about our, our mission is we are, our goal is how can we welcome people to a new place? How can we make Nashville Hermitage area um, a welcoming place? Um, and then also help get people to the point where they feel like confident and self-sufficient and can thrive in a new place. Um, for those of you who don't know a whole lot about refugees, um, refugees are different from just someone who immigrates to the country in the fact that they've been forced to leave. So they've fled um, their home countries due to conflict, due to um, like political violence, um, wars. So anyone who's coming here to the U.S., um, as a refugee, is not necessarily coming here um, by choice. A lot of times they're coming because they didn't have a lot of other choices. Um, what people don't always realize is that in order to be accepted into the U.S. Um, as a refugee, um, you go through years and years of vetting sometimes. So people sometimes will flee 
to a neighboring country, but that country's not gonna give them any rights or, um, or services. They're just gonna allow them to stay in a refugee camp until they can find another place. So when refugees come to the US, sometimes they've waited years to get here um, and to be approved. And, so, and they've had to go through a lot of interviews, a lot of process of vetting um, by, by international organizations as well as the US. Um, and each year it says less than 0.1% um, of refugees, so someone who has been identified as a refugee will actually be resettled to the US. Um, so the need, um, we are anticipating um, this year, this is the statistic from earlier this year, um, that in this fiscal year, um, the US will resettle about 125,000 refugees from around the world. Like I said, when you look at the huge number of displaced people, um, that's actually a really small amount that we are taking a little, a very small portion of the pie. Um, and to this area, so our organization alone um, has agreed to resettle 500 individuals to Nashville this year, um, and then a, about an additional 100 to a site that we have in Gallatin as well. Um, so that's a lot of individuals. Um, when you think about moving to a new place, um, I know just moving state to state, sometimes it's like to get connected and feel at home like, takes time. It takes like six months, and then when you throw on top of that, um, the fact that sometimes you don't speak the language, sometimes the systems are very, very different. Um, being able to navigate and find your way in a new place um, takes a whole lot more than just having someone who signs you up for benefits, gets your housing, and gets you enrolled in school. There's a lot of adjustment that takes place that happens within the context of community, that happens within like finding friends, finding people who you can call to be like, hey, where's the best place to get, you know, I, I'm needing some free food. Where's the best place to get that? How do, I, I have this light bill and I don't understand how to, how to make my payment online. There's a lot of extra things that having a community and having some people to support you can really help. So there's a lot of ways um, that you can get involved. I'm going to go over just a couple of them. Um, Co-sponsorship is a program that we have that if you as a group, so if you, this may be something that if you wanted to do as a whole church, you were to say like, hey, this is, we really, really want to get behind this. We as a community want to co-sponsor um, one refugee family. Um, you get together a group of at least seven people to kind of take the lead and then work really closely with our agency to help with all of those initial tasks of setting up an apartment, um, helping make sure that they have all the furniture they need, helping make sure um, their kids get enrolled in school. So a lot, what co-sponsorship does is it takes a team of people um, of at least seven to join with our organization and with like kind of the leadership of our organization to be able to do all of the tasks of helping to, to resettle a refugee family. Um, that is a, a much longer commitment we ask because you're actually come from beginning to end kind of helping from apartment setup all the way until you know the first like nine months of someone being here. Um, we, we ask for a longer commitment for that. So we also have a family mentorship program um, the Family Mentorship Program is what, what Woodmont Hills Church has been very heavily involved in. Um, they have had multiple teams and helped multiple families. Um, the Mentorship Program, we ask for a group, you can do it as an individual, we have some individual mentors, um, or a group of up to five people. So if you were gonna say, yeah, me and a couple of friends, we wanna be matched with a family, we wanna meet with them, the commitment is just once a week, um, you meet with them, and like I said, the, the point is to do all the extra things. For example, like social support, kind of informal English practice, um, and then helping people kind of learn to get, a, get around their neighborhood, their community. So we ask for one to two hours a week, so someone from your team meets with them, um, and then for a minimum of, of three months is what we ask for. Um, just in that initial adjustment phase, you're kind of their first um, American friend um, to help kind of help navigate and get connected to the community. Um, so that's a great way to be involved. And then we have a bunch of individual opportunities. The one that I'm going to highlight here is our transportation assistance program. Um, we provide transportation. Most of the families who arrive don't have vehicles. 
the public transportation system here is very, very difficult. <laughs> um, it's very limited. And so our staff ends up driving people like all day long sometimes. I, I talked to one of our case managers and she told me one day she spent six and a half hours of her day in the car driving people to doctor's appointments, driving people to the grocery store. Um, and so in that initial first couple of months, having volunteers to help step in and be like, yeah, I can take someone to a, a doctor's appointment um, is so helpful for our staff because it allows our staff to focus on some of the bigger work of getting someone resettled, the, the harder work um, of getting someone resettled in a place um, if someone can pick up transportation. We have a great program. It's like a 20 minute long training. Um, we check your, your vehicle insurance and record and everything. Um, and then we have a board and you get assigned to that board and you can see every week what are the needs that are posted. And if you're able to pick one up, you grab up that ride um, and you get all the information sent to you on pickup times and locations and all of that. So it's very, very easy. I always say transportation assistance is like the highest impact volunteer work you can do with the lowest commitment level. Because you're like, I have a really busy month. I can't pick up any rides this month totally fine. If you're like, I have six hours this week and I would be willing to pick up three rides, um, you can do that as well. It's like high impact, really low commitment. Um, and then the shopping assistance also is very similar where it's like when you have time to be able to take people to the grocery store, um, the grocery store is actually a very overwhelming place for some of the families we serve, um, especially if they're coming from a country that maybe just has a few local markets that they're used to picking up local veggies to walk into Walmart and be able to try to navigate that and find what they need um, can be really, really overwhelming. And so having someone who's just comes alongside to be like, yeah, I can take you to the grocery store and help you navigate the first couple of times you're here um, is a great help for us as well. Um, also, if you do not have time to, to volunteer, donation drives are also something that you can do. We have different needs that kind of pop up. So um, being able to like, get connected with us and see what our current needs are. Um, we actually have, right now, we were donated 24 adult bicycles um, for our clients, which is amazing. So we were able to, to deliver all of those bicycles to people who don't have any transportation, um, can help with them you know, if they're walking to the grocery store or taking an Uber to the grocery store, being able to, to take a bicycle and, and pick up a few things that way um, is really helpful for them. So, um, but what we, did, what we did not get donated was helmets or bike locks um, or any, any of the like accessories. So that's something that, you know, if you guys want to be like, hey, we could do a drive and, and get 24 helmets and, and bike locks, um, that could be something that you all could do. Um, and then um, financial sponsorship, we always receive um, any level of donation on our website. You can see like all the different levels and what that would, would do. A $4,000 donation is kind of what we say is the cost of initial resettlement for a family of four. Um, and you can kind of see the breakdown there of how we would use that financial sponsorship. So if you as, as a church body or as an individual or a couple individuals wanted to do um, sponsor a family just financially, um, you could also do that, and this is about what that would break down to. Um, yeah, anyway, I, like I said, I'm so grateful. I'm going to be here after service. Um, thank you guys so much for giving me a little piece of your time. Um, this has been a huge gift to me to be a part of an international community. I feel like I've learned so much actually about, about the heart of God. <laughs> you know, I've learned about hospitality. I've learned about um, how people do family and community really well and sometimes better than we do in the U.S. Um, a lot of the cultures um, that are coming here, we have so much to learn from and it's been a gift to me. So uh, my hope is that you know, other people can, can join and get involved um, and that you can actually be a part of, of learning and growing um, in that way as well. So thank you guys. I will be here afterwards if you have any questions. Um, I would love to talk to you. All right, everybody. Um, 
Flannel graph favorites, flannel graph, right? Um, We're continuing our series today. Um, Here's the scripture we're talking through today. We're talking about Genesis 1, 2, the story of Moses, um, which you probably remember um, as, you know, baby Moses is placed in a manger and he floats like a sweet little baby down the Nile and he's picked up by Pharaoh's daughter and wow, what an amazing story. Um, there's a lot more to it than that. Um, I don't know exactly how much we're going to get into it today, um, but uh, we'll see. So this is uh, Exodus chapter 2. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. And his sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. Note the underline if you've got a piece of paper. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. And when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for this morning. Uh, Thank you that we get to be together God, I just ask that you'll be with us for the next few minutes. God, if if there's anything I say that's not from you, I just ask that'll be removed from our memory. Um, God, help us to hear a word from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, in the spirit of flannel graph, um, most of the slides today are going to be picture heavy, okay? Uh, Because I think that's the best way to tell the story, right? So, uh, last week we talked about the story of Joseph. And if you remember how the story of Joseph ends, Joseph um, ends with his family coming to Egypt. So leaving the area that they were in during the famine and coming and moving to Egypt uh, with Joseph. All right? And they were given this land. They were treated as, you know, equals. Like, this is your land that you can have and do your shepherding. And that was a good way to treat a foreigner in our community, right? But that didn't last for very long. Um, So eventually, as does happen, these leaders change over time, and there became a new pharaoh. And this new pharaoh, he didn't like these people of Israel, and he didn't know Joseph, and he didn't care about that history. And there are starting to be a lot of them, so he enslaves them. Um, Instead of treating these foreigners in his land as if they are part of the family, making sure that they're taken care of, making sure that they're being treated equitably, Pharaoh enslaves the Israelites. And the Israelites still grow in number. Uh, They still are having babies and growing in number, all while being enslaved. And this cheeses Pharaoh a little bit. Uh, Now he's actually a little bit worried because now he's got this slave people and there's actually kind of a lot of them. They could rise up and take us out. So Pharaoh uh, tells uh, the midwives that if a boy is born, you should kill the baby. And uh, well, this is uh, Shifra and Pua right here. Shifra and Pua. These are two of the midwives uh, that have been commanded to kill all of these boy babies. So they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. I can do what I know is right, 
and not kill these babies, or I can do what my boss, uh, our leaders are telling me that, that I should do. Um, and so what they do is they lie to Pharaoh, and they say, Pharaoh, sorry, this whole plan to get rid of all of the baby boys isn't working because Hebrew women aren't like Egyptian women. They give birth so quickly. Like by the time that we even find out that they're going into labor, boom, by the time we get there, the baby's born, it's a whole thing, and we can't, we didn't get there fast enough. So this is the story that they're telling uh, Pharaoh. And Pharaoh takes that, we don't really know how he responds to that, but we do know eventually he says, okay, if that's not enough, we're, we're not just going to, you know, take, knock, wipe out the boy babies right after birth or right at birth. What we're going to do is we're going to throw all of them into the Nile River, which is a, not how we should treat foreigners in our land, right? Whatever Pharaoh is doing, we should be doing the opposite. Pharaoh is the worst character to this point in Scripture, right? He is terrible. He enslaves people. He it changes his mind. He goes back on the things that he said. He is a terrible person. Um, and so Moses' mother uh, successfully hides her baby, Moses, for three months. Now, we were at the zoo this week, and we saw a kangaroo, a baby kangaroo, in the mama kangaroo's pouch. And now, that's miraculous. If you haven't seen that, you need to see it. So I don't know how she was doing that, if she was wrapping him up. Uh, if you've ever had a, a tiny baby, they cry. So I don't know how she was hiding him so well. But she hid him for three months, um, but she could, felt like she could no longer get away with this. Um, so she does put her baby boy into the Nile River. Um, but she doesn't just toss him in there like some swimming lessons that I've seen online. Um, instead, she puts him in this basket. And in Scripture, the word for basket is the same Hebrew word that's used for the word ark uh, in Genesis, which is just an interesting uh, fact because God's, I think God's using that, right? God's using this ark, this basket, to deliver, to deliver this baby, just like God delivered Noah and his family. And so Moses' mother puts Moses in this papyrus basket and puts him down the Nile River, where he is found by Pharaoh's daughter, the girl whose dad wants all of these babies out of here, right? And so in this crazy, miraculous turn of fate, Moses is now going to be raised in Pharaoh's house. Now, he goes back to his mother's house in another miraculous turn of fate. He ends up being, going back and being nursed by his mother and taken care of by his mother until she gives him back. But it was Pharaoh's own family that was his undoing, right? Isn't that ironic? Um, just, just another weird, miraculous turn of fate about this story. And so Moses... Uh, goes back to Pharaoh's house after some time, and he grows into a man, and he probably looked like this, right? He was an Egyptian. Uh, he probably had this weird, you know, dysmorphia about, am I an Egyptian? But I, I know I'm a Hebrew because I did live with the Hebrews for some time, and that's confusing. Um, and then one day, Moses is out uh, in Egypt, and he sees uh, an Egyptian uh, beating an Israelite. And so he intervenes and actually kills the Egyptian uh, in this altercation. He comes out uh, a day later, soon after, and two Hebrews are fighting, and he says, hey, what are you guys doing? And they're like, what are you going to kill us too? They, they're like, how can you tell someone to stop fighting? Moses, you're, you just killed someone the other day, right? And so Moses flees, and he becomes this shepherd here. Uh, he flees, he becomes a shepherd, he lives out uh, away from Egypt, um, and he's a shepherd, he gets married, uh, he's got this whole family of his own, and he's doing shepherd, and years pass. And then, if you remember the story of Moses, um, Moses encounters a burning bush. And God speaks through this burning bush, telling Moses to go back 
to Egypt. And Moses has all of these excuses, right? But God did not deliver Moses just so that he, from, you know, he didn't just deliver Moses through the Nile River uh, so that he could just escape and be some farmer out in the middle of nowhere, some shepherd. He's, he's delivered Moses for a purpose. And this purpose is that God wants Moses to go back and assist God in freeing the people of Israel from Egypt. So Moses goes back to Egypt. He didn't want to. He had all these excuses. But he eventually does go back to Egypt and says, Pharaoh, God said, let my people go. Pharaoh, Pharaoh, right? So if you remember that song. Um, and Pharaoh says, no, why would I do that? They're my slaves. And so then uh, we know the story of the ten plagues. Um, uh, the Nile River turns to blood. I'm not going to name them all. You can read them. Uh, I also don't want to be put on the spot and try to name them off the top of my head. That might not go well. Uh, but there's ten plagues. And uh, the final plague, right, is that the firstborn son of, in every household in Egypt is going to die, which is a terrible situation. Uh, it's horrible. Um, the irony is that it's the exact same uh, punishment that Pharaoh had for the Hebrew people as slaves, right? Throw all of your baby boys into the Nile River. And so there's this tension there. And after the 10th plague, Pharaoh says, get out of my sight. I do not want you troublemakers here anymore. You're not worth it. Get out of here. And so they go, but Pharaoh's a terrible guy, and Pharaoh changes his mind and goes back on what he said, and he says, we've got to go and get those guys back or kill them. And so they go after them, and if you know the story, all of the Israelites are stranded up against uh, the Red Sea, and there's the Egyptian army coming to get them, and uh, God parts the sea, and they walk through it, and the water comes down on the Egyptian army, and they're wiped out, right? So at last, the people of Israel have been delivered, and uh, it doesn't stay that way, though, because when God delivers someone, when God delivers a group of people, God doesn't just deliver it so that they can live happily ever after. No, they now have been commissioned into something else, and that's when we see the Ten Commandments. All right, because God is saying, I have delivered you from Egypt, so this is how I want you to live. This is the thing that I'm calling you to do. Hold these 10 things and you will live well. You will be a blessing to the other people of Israel. You will be a blessing to the people outside of Israel if you follow these 10 commandments. So that's the story. Right? And we know that the story of Israel goes on long, long, and you know, we're also grafted into that now, and that's a, the whole story of the Bible. But this story, the story of Moses, this is a story about deliverance. This is a story about deliverance. The people of Egypt, I mean the people of Israel in Egypt, Moses, baby Moses in Egypt, was delivered. But Moses is not just delivered, but he is enrolled in the ministry of deliverance. God says, Moses, I have delivered you from certain death as a baby, but it wasn't just so that you can be free and do what you want. I have a purpose for you. I am calling you into something bigger, something better. Moses was delivered through water, through the Nile River. The people of Israel delivered through water at the Red Sea. We, too, experienced delivered, being delivered through water in baptism, right? But we're not just delivered so that we can go and do the things that we want to do free of oppression, we are delivered so that we can then partner in the deliverance God has for those around us, our communities, and our neighbors. 
And so when we do things like help a refugee feel more at home in our community, uh, when we do things like help people feed their families, when we do things like walk someone that we work with through a hard time, um, when we offer prayer and support for people in our church body, we are assisting God in the ministry of deliverance. Not that God needs our help, but God knows that that's good for us too. It's good for us to join into what God is doing around us. And we don't have to do anything crazy. Sometimes I think we sit here and we hear, I'm supposed to do something, but we, we're like, but I'm just me. Moses said, God, I am not even good at talking. I should not be in charge of you know, getting the people of Israel out of Egypt. We all have these excuses. Um, but I want us to think about the two midwives, Shifra and Pua. I think they're the only two midwives who are given names in Scripture. Because they did what they could in the position that they were in because they knew that there was a right thing to do and a wrong thing to do. And I think we are faced with those types of decisions all the time. And it's not always in the middle of genocide or something extreme. But all of us, every single day that we live, we have an opportunity to join into the deliverance that God has for us and the people around us. And Shifra and Pua decided that I'm not just going to do business as usual and do what I'm told today because I think that God is calling me into doing something else. If Shifra and Pua and the other midwives in, Israel, in Egypt had just gone along with Pharaoh's evil plan, uh, the story wouldn't be the way that it is. It'd be a different story. God could have still worked. God still could have brought redemption for his people, but it would have been a different story. Shifra and Pua decided to join into that story of deliverance. And so every day when we go out into the world, we can ask ourselves, how can I join into this ministry of deliverance? When we were doing our Surprise the World series back in the beginning of the year, we talked about um, how we can bless other people, uh, how we can learn about other people, learn from Christ, and we can eat together and we can do all of these different things to join into what God is already doing in our world around us. So these are the choices that we get to make every day. It's not as extreme as Shifra and Pua, but they didn't do anything crazy. They did something that was well within their power to do because it was the right thing to do. And so this morning, uh, we're going to go to the table together. Uh, we get to remember Jesus who has done something um, amazing for us. We have been delivered through Jesus from death. We've been delivered uh, through Jesus from uh, the abandonment that we might face otherwise. We have a friend in Jesus. We have a savior in Jesus. We have a redeemer in Jesus and a deliverer in Jesus. So when we go to the table this morning, we get to remember that. And we get to remember that every single week. And because of that, we get to help God in that ministry of deliverance around us. So we'll remember Jesus as we go to the table this morning. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for Shifra and Pua doing something that they knew was right. Um, thank you for delivering us delivering the people of Israel. God, thank you for bringing us into the family. God, be with us as we go to the table this morning, as we remember you and what you've done for us. Help us to be more like Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's go to the table.
gracious God, we are thankful for another day, another time that we've had just to worship. Father, we're thankful for uh, so many things. Father, we're thankful for deliverance and the way it works out in our lives. Father, um, lead us into those waters where uh, we don't know what's going on. We know you're there and you know you're leading us. Father, help us to be your, your people everywhere this week. Father, just thank you for opportunities. Give us challenges. Help us to live into those. Father, walk with us. Help us to be your people. Thank you for today. Thank you for Jesus in his name. Amen.